Sound Science Center here in town, and I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about what's going on in the sound. When I'm cruising around town, one of the more common questions is, what's happening in Prince William Sound? And so it seems like every couple of years I'll give a talk like this and, and talk a little bit about what the, the trends are in, in the current situation. As, as most of you probably know, we've had some pretty unusual conditions the last, uh, the last few years. So. I'm going to start with the, the longer term, such as we have it, and then move in and talk about our, our more recent marine sea wave. So just to back us out and set the stage, hopefully everybody knows what Prince William Sound is right here. It's, uh, I call it a, a large <coughs> estuary or a small sea. Um, the cool thing about this part of the world is you can see a lot of the surface oceanography by eye from space. Um, it's obviously ringed by lots of big mountains. The, the winds tend to come from the west and get uplifted and deposit lots of snow and rain, perhaps you noted. Uh, and that all dumps out into the ocean and creates uh, the Alaska Coastal Current, which you can see here in the turbidity signal. That's just the cloudiness of the water that's caused by uh, ground up rock, we call it glacial flour, that gets washed down uh, into the surface of the ocean. It's, it's kind of like a, a river on top of the ocean. Uh, water likes to form layers. Uh, we'll see a few examples of that uh, in the talk tonight. Um, one way is to heat the water up. H hot water tends to want to ride over top of colder water. Or fresher water, uh, because it has less stuff in it than salty water, will tend to ride up on top. And that's what happens to create the coastal current here. All that water dumps out and stays on top of the surface ocean and uh, through the Coriolis force, which we won't even get into, uh, it gets trapped along the coast and, and moves along uh, from east to west, basically. Uh, here at Cape St. Elias, it kind of separates and it whips around like a fire hose. Uh, sometimes it continues along the continental shelf here. Sometimes it will wrap around uh, in towards Prince William Sound. Uh, here, obviously, is the Copper River. That's the largest point source of fresh water in the North Gulf Coast. And that also dumps out in the ocean, rides on top, and tends to travel along the coast, and often goes into to Prince William Sound. Uh, as well, there's the countless um, small rivers, ice sheets, uh, etc., um, small watersheds that are dumping into, into Prince William Sound. Uh, now, we've, we've been doing regular surveys of Prince William Sound since 2009. We've done 53 of them up till now. And this is our, our standard cruise track. Uh, we basically just do a lap of the sound. And it's a pretty fun day. Uh, Science Center has a little boat. You go out, laps around, turn a lot of fuel into noise. And at each station, we have our standard instrument that we drop, and that's called a CTD, which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. And what we do is we drop it down into the ocean, and it measures all kinds of important things. Here I'm just showing temperature. Call it back, and off we go to the next station after maybe collecting a few samples. Um, th this will show up a bunch in this talk. This is the way that oceanographers like to look at um, profiles in the ocean. They like to push the surface at the top and deep water down below. So you can kind of think of it as looking at it from the side with, with the, the top at the top of the graph. And this, uh, this is a temperature trace here, uh, quite warm at the surface. It was from in the summer sometime, the data I took it from. And then um, getting quite a bit colder down below. And again, that's that tendency of, of water to, uh, to form, form layers. 
uh, now as well as us, people have been, as near as I can tell, um, collecting CTV data in, in the sound for about 40 years. Um, I, a few years ago, I went and tried to find all of the data uh, in Prince William Sound that I could get my hands on, and this is sort of the, the sum total of it. Each of those little points there is uh, an individual CTV cast, and there's 23,000 odd individual casts, and now a little bit over 7 million uh, separate data points. So it's getting to be a, a pretty big uh, data record. So we can, we can use that to give us uh, some context of uh, how the, the sound is and how it's, how it's changing. This is uh, just to give you an idea of where that data is at. This is year along the side here from 1974 to present day. And then I just divided it up by the month of the year. So every one of those dots, somebody has been out in a boat in the central part of Prince William Sound and dropped one of those CPUs and made a measurement. And, and what you can see here is like in the late 70s, they were doing outer continental shelf oil and gas exploration. So there's some data from that. Then there's the vast wasteland of the 80s. Uh, in 1989, perhaps you heard there was an oil spill. And people started getting very, very interested in the sound. And, and since then, we've got quite a lot of, uh, of observations. Some of them are sort of on top of each other. You can't really make them all out. Now, that's great, but it's also kind of a problem, because it makes for a very kind of messy data set. Um, and just to illustrate this, I made this little cartoon. So the red dots here are, say, Project A. They went out um, three times and uh, collected some data. This is the temperature they observed near the surface in the central part of the sound. And then Project B goes out, and they go out at different times, maybe share some times with that first project, but then see some other times. Uh, so it's kind of hard to compare different times. You're going to have a third project that's maybe looking somewhere else as well. But when you have all kinds of projects going out over time, you can lump them all together, and it gives you a picture of sort of the seasonality of, of the sound. So this is all of the observations that I could find at two meters depth, so kind of my height under the water, uh, in, in Prince William Sound in the Central Park. And so what we can do is try to find a line that kind of goes through the middle of that. And there's an equation there that um, cosines are good for describing waves and cycles and things like that. And just having an annual cycle, it, it works fairly well. And that lets us uh, come up with kind of an average for, say, what temperature is doing over the course of the year. And now I'll show you uh, what that actually looks like. This is temperature, and with each time step, we're moving down in the water by one meter. And so the red line is the sort of average, and then the black dots are all of the, the observations that we have. And so as we move down further and further away from the surface, it starts to get colder, and the seasonality kind of tends to damp out. It gets flatter and flatter looking. I don't even remember how far I let this go to. Uh, the sound is, max depth is 700 meters, average depth is about 200 meters. Or 400 meters, so I probably said it to go there. We can carry on. <laughs> Here's the same thing with salinity. Uh, again, moving down. So uh, salty in the winter, uh, getting fresh in the uh, spring and summer as precipitation, snow melt, and stuff like that comes online. And, and don't worry if you feel like you missed anything. I'll have a summary of this in a sec. I let my water jug freeze and now it won't sit right. <laughs> uh, and once we get down uh, 300 feet, 100 meters or so, there's not a lot going on um, seasonally. So what we can do is summarize all of that into uh, a heat map, and that's what I've done here. Uh, so here I have, again, the surface at the top, 400 meters near the bottom, uh, on the bottom here, and, and you can't really see it, but this this uh, panel here is uh, several hundreds of thousands of individual data points, and they all kind of tend to smooch together. Um, so the on the right here, I've basically taken that line that I was fitting through everything, 
and plotted that out as, as a heat map. And the, the temperature here, of course, or the, <laughs> the heat corresponds to, to the temperature. So cool color is cool, warm color is warm. And it's pretty much what you'd expect. Here we have January, February, March, the winter. It's pretty stormy, it's pretty cold. Um, the water generally gets mixed up quite well, so it's more or less the same temperature uh, everywhere. As we move into April, May, the days start to get longer, like they're doing now. Uh, the surface of the ocean starts to heat up, and here we have those, those warm colors showing up, uh, moving into the summer, um, 15 degrees or so uh, on average. And then uh, once the equinox weather comes in autumn, we start getting our autumn storms, and it starts mixing all that heat down into the interior of, of the sound. And here's the same thing with salinity. Uh, again, uh, actual observations and then this fitted model, when it matches up more or less with, with temperature. Again, in the winter, we have uh, lots, of, lots of mixing, um, not a lot of fresh water coming in because it's mostly falling with snow uh, around July, uh, June or July. The rivers uh, reach max output, so we have a lot of fresh water moving into the ocean. And so at the surface here, we see uh, the water start to freshen. Uh, cooler, cooler colors are lower salinities, so pressure loss. Uh, and again, this is, this is a result of the tendency of water to want to form into layers. That fresh water wants to stay up on the top of the saltier water until it gets mixed in. And that's what happens in autumn. We get those equinox storms, things get mixed up, and all that fresh water gets mixed down into the interior of the sand. Um, as, as well here, I'm not gonna talk about it a ton, but uh, you can see here in the summer, the salinity is actually increasing a little bit at depth. And that's because uh, what happens in the, the summer in the sound is there's uh, deep water renewal. Uh, so water can actually spill into the deep water of the sound from the shelf, and it makes the water uh, a little a little saltier, because the water that comes from the North Pacific is a little bit a little bit saltier. So that's great. Um, that's just sort of an average picture of what happens um, over this 40-year data set that I put together. So it's it's kind of a polite fiction that we can we can use to compare things. Um, so going back to this example of two meter temperatures uh, in the sound, uh, what you can do after you fit your um, your average for the year is you can use that as a point to split your observations into whether it was warmer or cooler, say, than average. And we call this an anomaly. And there's going to be lots and lots of anomaly plots. Um, this is climatologists' bread and butter. Um, so yeah, in the red here, anything above that line uh, are observations that were warmer than that average, and then in blue are all the observations that were cooler. So we can do this with any observation we take. We can uh, do a CPD cast, look at it, and say, okay, so the temperatures that I just observed, are they above average or below average? And we can use that to compare year to year. And so this is a, an anomaly plot for the central part of Prince William Sound. Uh, I just picked out a few separate depths here for each panel. So that's two meters, again, right near surface, 25 meters, 50 meters, and 200 meters, so getting deeper. Uh, on the side here is the temperature anomaly. And the zero line here means right on the average. Anything above that is warmer than average. Anything below that is cooler than average. Again, color-coded that, so the red is warmer, <coughs> cooler. Uh, the green line is the long-term trend, so it's things are getting warmer or cooler on, on average. And uh, there's some statistics involved with that. I, I believe if they are indistinguishable from noise, the, the text is red. So all of these are actually uh, quote-unquote real. And, and so what we see is not a huge trend at the surface, um, 20th of a degree per decade, so quite small. Um, but as we move down to deeper and deeper depths, this green line gets steeper and steeper. Uh, and so in, in deeper waters, we're seeing something like a fifth of a degree uh, Celsius per, per decade in, in warming. Now the kind of neat thing is, I, I 
I forgot to mention on that um, one map, I had divided the sound up into some different regions. Um, and this is the temperature anomaly in the northwestern part of the sound. So I think uh, Whittier, College Fjord, um, Night Island Pass, the, the other side of the sound, um, basically where, where all the ice sheets are. And, and the, the neat thing here is um, this long-term trend at the surface is actually negative. So it's, it's cooling at the surface uh, over the last, last 40 years. Um, no, no real trend in the mid-depth, but then as we go deeper, we again see that, that warming trend. So it's warming deeper down in the ocean. And again, in the Northwest Sound, um, when we look at the salinity anomaly, so it's the same idea as the temperature, um, but looking at the saltiness of the water, uh, so red is saltier than average, blue is fresher than average. Uh, we see a, a real striking trend in the surface water where it's, it's getting fresher over time. And then as we move down away from the surface, it's, it's uh, more of a flat trend. And that's really the only place we see any kind of trend in salinity in the sound. Uh, so why to explain that? Um, this, is a, this is a figure, uh, it's actually from a paper that just uh, was published yesterday, officially. So if anybody wants to read it, just let me know and I'll send you a copy. Um, and the top four panels here are just the surface temperature in various parts of the sound, and you can, you can safely ignore them. Um, the bottom here is the, the heat flux anomaly. So that's the heat uh, coming into or out of the ocean. And again, it's just expressed as an anomaly. And you can see pretty clearly there's a, a negative trend here in, in the heat flux. And that's positive outward, which is a little weird to think about, but basically means that heat is being retained in, in the ocean, as opposed to um, aggregate. And then on the bottom here, this is uh, an index of the upwelling that happens on the shelf uh, outside of the sound. And that's kind of what drives that deep water renewal that I had mentioned. And, and again here, th this is uh, anomaly plots, the red and the blue bars. Uh, these dots here are just uh, annual totals of the amount of transport in or out of the sound, basically. And, and there's a positive trend here. So we're seeing more and more transport into the sound um, during that uh, summer uh, deep water renewal season. Um, and also, obviously, when we're talking about fresh and salty water, the question is, where is um, that fresh water coming from that's driving a decrease in salinity in the other side of the sound? Uh, so here I have uh, precipitation anomaly, just rain, and uh, here I have discharge anomaly, which is from a, uh, a model that was put together by some, some researchers down in, in Oregon. Uh, this goes from 1979 to 2015. And, and really, um, this, this is just in Prince William Sound. We have, as everyone knows, pretty tremendous variability in precipitation around here, but there isn't really any kind of trend. It's not like we're getting more rain here um, uh, over time um, relative to historical traditions. Um, but there is a slight trend in the discharge anomaly, and that's the amount of water that is entering the, the sound from the edges, and that's streams, um, ice melt, snow melt, all of it put together. And so we can put all of that together into a picture, and I, I don't even really need to show you a graph, I can just show you a picture. This is Columbia Glacier uh, by Valdez Arm in 1987, and there it is in, in 2014. So it's a, a fairly striking loss of, of ice mass over uh, 30 years. And this is kind of our, our poster child for, for ice loss in Prince William Sound, really. Um, I actually got, I got interested uh, this afternoon. I looked on Google Earth, because they have a pretty good um, height on that. You can just put a cursor on Google Earth and see how high a spot is. And this spot right here on the moon attack, uh, whoop, where it was covered in ice here, and it's now clear, that's about 1,200 feet above sea level. So that's 1,200 feet of ice gone just to sea level. And, uh, and Caitlin and I were cruising around in the, the research boat there a few years ago and banging away with her sounder. And there's 
there's another 1,200 feet of water underneath that. So that's something like 2,500 feet of ice, which has melted and gone into the ocean. What was that date on the other picture? Uh, 1987. And, and actually, um, now it's actually increases up there and comes out there. And it'll probably not be a tide water, it, well, it will not be a tide water glacier in our lifetimes if everyone is reasonably careful. <laughs> <laughs> takes care of himself. <laughs> So there is a fairly obvious explanation for um, why it might be cooling in the sur first surface part of the sound, where there's lots of ice sheet, and why it might be freshening. Uh, there is a paper about Columbia Glacier. It's, it's several years old now, and they figured that just what had melted in the time that they were aware of um, was responsible for about 1% of global sea level rise, because there's how much uh, ice. Just from that glacier alone? Just from that glacier. And is that Heather Island that's in the very bottom center there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they, there, used, or there is still a cabin there, I guess, that they had to observe the, the face, uh, which is now pretty useless. So just to put all these ideas together into cartoon form, I have this. And this is... Um, to try and bring all of these things um, together. So we have um, more fresh water entering into the ocean um, on average, and it tends to form that layer that I mentioned. And so we get this cold fresh water on the surface, and it's getting pushed from behind by more, more fresh water. And so as it does that, as the water moves out, it tends to drag along the saltier water beneath it. And it creates what we call an estuarine circulation. So it actually tends to pull in uh, deeper water as it, as it moves out. And so this deeper water, which is coming from the Gulf of Alaska, is itself uh, warming over time. And so that is our warming trend at depth. Um, in, enhanced uh, transport, as I showed you from that, um, that one up over the plot. So that's kind of the 40-year uh, picture, but I'm just going back to our, our surface, sea surface temperatures here. These are four different zones in the sound, and you can see in 2013, 2014, everything um, flipped pretty consistently to warm anomalies. And just to highlight what went down, this is a movie of sea surface temperatures. Here we are up here, uh, starting in 2013. It's going about three days, I think, with every step. And this is sea surface temperature anomaly. So again, warm colors are hot, blue colors are cool. And in late 2013, 2014, we see that basically most of the Gulf is, is quite warm. There's little wiggles here and there, but it stays that way pretty consistently for quite a while. We're in October, November, September, into 2015, still pretty warm. There's May, June, still pretty warm. Moving into autumn. Happy New Year! In 2016, it starts breaking up a little bit. It does actually come back somewhat. There's autumn 2016. And then in 2017, it's getting slightly cool or towards climatology that average. And that 
that's yesterday. Um, and I should also mention the expert Pacific here, we're currently in a La Nina advisory, um, so a lot of the expert Pacific is, is cooler than average as well, which is what we're getting to see with the La Nina. Um, what are those circular deals on the equator there? Uh, there's, there's a lot going on at the equator. <laughs> There's uh, countercurrents and eddies forming, um, and I, it's it's been 20 years since I took the class where they taught me about that, so I, I couldn't tell you the exact mechanism. But um, yeah, there's there's quite a lot going on at the equator that makes those those jets, but they're consistently there. They're kind of cool. Um, so yeah, the the short answer is that in late 2013, early 2014, most of the uh, northern Gulf of Alaska flipped to a, a warm anomaly. It was a really warm anomaly, uh, a, a record breaker. And this is a, a figure I, I grabbed from a, a paper just trying to illustrate what caused that. This is sea surface temperature on the, the left hand side here. Uh, this is January, February, March of 2014, October, November, December 2014, and January, February, March 2015. Um, all showing again that, that warm blob. And this here is sea level pressure. And so that's um, what's going on in the atmosphere, basically. And, and what, what went down was we had a very, very, some of you may remember, we had a really long stretch of really nice weather. It was high pressure, it was really sunny. Uh, and that's because we had what the meteorologists called the ridiculously resilient ridge. Um, so we had low pressure over the southern gulf and then high pressure in the north gulf and, and over land. And it just sat there um, with, with the high pressure. Uh, whereas normally we have mostly low pressure, like so, the Aleutian low, big storms, uh, lots going on, lots of, lots of mixing. And, and it happened again, um, not quite as strongly, but in, in 2015. And so what that ridge did was it, it basically blocked the storm track. And we didn't get those big North Pacific lows that we usually get. And, and so the heat that had gone into the ocean as part of that annual cycle by the, uh, the warming of the sun in the spring and the summer didn't get mixed out of the ocean like it normally does. It, it basically stayed put. Uh, so it wasn't really a, a warming. It was more like a not cooling that led to the blob. So all of this, quote unquote, surplus uh, heat remained in the ocean and led to what we're now calling a, a marine heat wave. And so in the sound, we have um, this fancy geowismatron that actually let us watch the blob roll into Prince William Sound in quite high resolution. This is the profiler here, um, just retrieving it for some service. And, and what it does, zoom me out here, it sits down at depth, and when it's told to, it wakes up and starts rising to the surface. And while it's doing that, it measures all kinds of oceanographic things, uh, same as our super duty drop from the ship. And I've shown four of the things we measure on, on the side there. Uh, when it gets to the surface, it, uh, it actually connects into the cell uh, network. It will send me a little bit of data. I can send it instructions if it needs to do something different. And then it will pull itself down and go back to sleep. Uh, so we can leave that out there, and it can do that as often as we tell it, as, as long as the, the battery remains charged. And, and let us watch the sound a lot more closely than if we were going out in a boat. And yeah, when we first started, we had it doing this daily. And the last couple of years, we've done it twice daily. So this is the temperature record from that profiler uh, from 2014 through to 2017. And again, it's the same format of picture. That's the surface. That's 60 meters depth where it generally uh, sleeps and hangs out. Uh, this is mid-March going through to early December. And it's again color-coded with the, the temperature anomaly. So white is, is zero, uh, red is hot, blue is cold. And uh, we have 
kind of a issue with a lot of part of 2014, but we did actually see um, this warm uh, anomaly coming through in 2014 in, in the sound. Uh, still there throughout the winter in 2015. We had a lot of weird stuff going on in the spring. Um, those are actually a couple of big storm events that mix things up. Uh, but then going into the into the summer, uh, a quite strong warm anomaly. And then in 2016, it was really something. Um, the, the sound generally tends to lag uh, the gulf by about a year. And so even though the gulf was starting to show some signs of cooling in 2016, in, or in 2016, in Prince William Sound, um, that was actually our, our record anomaly, our record warm summer. So the entire surface layer of the sound here was well above average. And here in late spring, early summer, it was uh, as much as four degrees Celsius above average, which is kind of a big deal for a lot of biological things. How can you miss in the three months? Just vacation? Or? Uh, <laughs> it was new in 2014, and uh, we had some corrosion on a cable that basically needed to come back to go back to the shop. Um, and yeah, every year you can see there's a few gaps here. And sometimes that's because something broke. Sometimes the batteries ran out and we couldn't get out to service it because the weather was snotty or something. Uh, we try to have it out there operating all the time, but we don't always quite, quite make it. So that's what these little like oh, gaps are. Like every March. Service to oh, yeah, yeah. Um, everything needs to be calibrated uh, every year. All the instruments have to come off and go down south to a calibration lab. Uh, right now, all of the, the guts and the grain box are down being serviced in, in Oregon. Uh, when we first started doing it, I, I really wanted to have it out there year-round, but um, you would really need two to do that. And it's quarter million, $300,000 worth of stuff. And I haven't quite found the sugar daddy to find me another one yet. But. I'm, I'm pastoring people, then someday. Give you five bucks. Yeah. What's that? I'll give you five bucks. <laughs> I have five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, so really, really warm um, in, in the sound as, as the rest of the Gulf. And, and really persisting into last year as well, especially up here at the surface. And, uh, here in the in the fall, it looks like actually that fall breakdown happened a little earlier, so this might not be uh, climatology, more like timing uh, happening. Uh, the other thing I should point out here is, in, at least, in, oh, yeah, actually every year, it's, it's it looks cooler than average um, in the deeper waters away from from the surface, and and what that likely is is again this tendency of water to form layers. The warmer the water is at the surface, the stronger that layer is going to be, and the harder it is for wind to, to break it up. And, and so to try and illustrate that, I made this incredibly busy figure. Um, this, this dotted line here is, you can think of it as the thickness of that surface layer. Uh, we call it um, mixed layer depth. And, and this is again from that 40-year um, time series. So this is uh, an, an average that, that doesn't really exist. Um, and then each of these dots here are from each of those profiles of the profiler, the, the mixed layer depth that um, I estimated uh, from the data I collected. And, and the point here is that a lot of the time in these log years, this mixed layer depth um, that we observed was quite a lot shallower than uh, the mixed layer depth usually is. And so this, this cool anomaly is actually just because the, um, the thickness of the surface layer is, is a lot thinner than usual, so there's more deep water near the surface, which tends to be cooler, which gives us this, this pattern. Uh, like I mentioned, we, we collect a lot more than just temperature on that thing, and so this is um, some of the other things we measured. The top panel here is temperature, that's salinity. This is chlorophyll A fluorescence, which tells us uh, a rough guess of how much phytoplankton there is. 
Um, Chlorophyll A is what makes plants green. If you shine blue light at it, it will shine a red light back, which tells you kind of how much chlorophyll there is, and that kind of tells you how much plant there is. Uh, and then on the bottom here, this is uh, nitrate. And nitrate is the, the most important nutrient in the circulation in coastal Alaska. That's kind of what, what limits things. And so this, this shows more or less that same kind of seasonal pattern uh, I showed you in, in the average. Uh, we have warming into spring and summer, uh, warming up at the surface layer, and then getting mixed down into autumn. Uh, you can see little storm events here that kind of disrupt that, so the reality is a little messier than the, the average. Uh, same with salinity, uh, quite salty in, in winter, and then into summer it gets uh, fresh in the surface layer. Uh, in chlorophyll, we see a big spring bloom, and this happens more or less every year. Um, and the bloom is usually vigorous enough that um, the butterfly can use up all the nutrients. Uh, so these blue areas here are where the nutrients are more or less undetectable. And that's because the, the single cell plants, the phytoplankton, have stripped it out of the water. Uh, we do see it get moved up to the surface again, often matching up with those little, little storm events. So that was 2015. That, uh, this is this year, uh, same basic pattern. This year we had a much stronger uh, spring bloom, um, and the, the nitrate was basically used up uh, by mid-April, and it stayed that way for the entire summer. Uh, so we wind up with this situation where uh, there's called, called a neutrophine, the line where nutrients basically run out, and that's where phytoplankton live. So they're right at the edge where there's some, some nutrients, but they're still kind of close to the sun, so they can absorb light and photosynthesize. And, and so in trying to figure out what kind of effects um, there might have been by the blob, this is sort of where I started. Like, is this spring bloom stronger? Uh, is this autumn or uh, subsurface bloom stronger? Does anything happen in the autumn? And I, don't, I don't have a ton of answers, but I've put together a little bit of data. And so what I'll do is kind of move up the food web and talk about some of the stuff that's happened in the sound uh, during these, these blob years. So we have a 40 year time series of CTD data, of temperature and salinity. We don't have anything like that for basically anything biological. How much plankton there is. Um, probably fish would be our, our best bet. Um, so what I put together here is, um, this is this is again chlorophyll, so rough proxy of plants. Um, from 2010, when we started doing our, our surveys to the end of last year. And so the top panel here is integrated chlorophyll. It's just the total amount of chlorophyll we observed. Um, and I've broken it down to some monthly averages. And there's not really a, a super big trend that I can detect, at least in the sound, from the blog, maybe a little low, though um, things definitely picked up in 2017. And then the first year of the blog, we actually had a fairly good spring bloom, it looks like. Um, so I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, the second panel here is the, the depth of the chlorophyll maximum. So that's where most of the phytoplankton is in the water column. I was wondering if that change in the layering of the water might alter where they are and, and so that's yeah, basically how, how deep um, the, the chlorophyll is concentrated. And there's maybe a little bit of a, a trend over the blog years, but I'm not really convinced. How does that graph work? Is it five feet out of the water and five feet underwater? Uh, oh, no, no. Uh, it's, again, based on an average. So, so this would be five meters higher than average, and this would be seven meters lower an average. So the depth of that that layer, basically. Uh, so yeah. Rob, can you, Marianne, was 2014 the big summer sky? 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. Can, 
Can you tell anything from looking at all your data? Okay, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I forgot to acknowledge all the people on my title slide um, are people who I stole slides from on um, various things going on in, in the sound. And that's kind of where we're, where we're getting to right now. Um, as well as CTD data, we, um, we collect plankton. We throw a plankton net through the water. It's basically a, a wind sock made out of mesh that strains out the plankton. And then we pickle them and take them back to the lab. And Caitlin counts them all. And um, this is from her data. This is um, throughout the sound, all of the zooplankton that we're seeing, again, from when we started in 2018 to uh, the end of, of last year. And we've just broken it out into all of the zooplankton. Um, and then some of the, the warm water species, things that are more common, like down in the California current. Uh, and then cool water species, which are what we usually see around here. And there's, there's definitely some, some trends there. Not really much going on in the total amount of zooplankton, but uh, definitely a switch where we didn't see very many warm water species. And then in the blog years, they really started showing up. And this is it's kind of a funny unit. It's a, it's a log unit. So this means upwards of a tenfold increase in those warm water species. And, and this matches with what a lot of our colleagues are seeing like uh, on the steward line. Yeah, we caught like a mackerel staining in 2016. Right, right, there, yeah. There was a few other people too. Scott was seeing mola mola cruising yeah. around just outside the sound. You guys had a mola mola wash up on your beach, right? I thought it was called a sun face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, lots of lots of weird species um, showing up, not just not just in plankton. Uh, and th th the important thing about this is the, the warmer water species tend to be smaller bodied and they tend to have a lot less lipid. Mm -hmm. uh, the cool water species are generally big, and they have great big lipid sacs inside them. So they're really, really high quality food for fish and birds and, and things like that. Uh, this is a slide I stole from Scott. Um, moving up from plankton, things that eat plankton, we saw some pretty big changes in forage fish. This is a time series of pairing from 1980 to present. Are those um, preliminary? No, so the blue was model data, and then the red I shifted over to uh, acoustic survey data because the model hadn't run mm. in the last couple of years. Right, so different methods, but um, by all indications, quite a lot fewer herring. Um, Yumi Mitsu and John Pyatt with USGS are working with various forage fish in the sound. Um, this is a plot of, of sand lands. This, this one on the left here is their, their length, how long they are. Um, the one on the right is how much energy they have. Uh, this is 2012, pre blob, 2016. And then these boxes just show the range in, in length of two ages of, of sand lands. So, these are the age ones, and these are age zero, the babies. And so it's really converging. Basically, by 2016, a one-year-old was the same size as a baby used to be at age zero. And, and same with their, their energy content. They were really, really uh, funny. Is and that a fish? Is that called a sandworm? Yes. And then things that eat sand lance. Um, Scott Hatch is a retired USGS biologist. He, he runs an observatory on Milton Island. And uh, they track the diets of various seabirds. They, they bring uh, fish back to, to the island, and they, they, can, they can measure it. And this is uh, a really nice long time series of diets in, in kittiwakes. And so just prior to the blog here, Lots and lots of capelin, and uh, come 2014, they really, really disappear. Capelin seem to be kind of a cold water species. They're often really common uh, around uh, glaciers, glacial fjords. Um, this is this is sand lamps here. It was on a decline before the blog, and then, and then really bottomed out. Uh, so in 2014, 
a, a really big new player in their diet was nictophans. Those are lantern fish. Those are deep sea fish. They're they're quite small, and they do these giant migrations every day, like a couple thousand meters, ebbing ebbing the open ocean. Uh, so big shift in the prey available um, to to the cave waves. Table fish and that must be juvenile. Yeah, little little. Uh, We had a gigantic uh, murder rack. Estimates vary. There was over 50,000 actual dead bodies observed. Um, so the actual poll was showing sure hundreds of thousands um, in in 2015. And uh, this is from uh, John John Pyatt. This is just a these are histograms of uh, the body mass of birds. Uh, so heavy and, and light. And this, this dashed line here is basically the starvation line. So this is what they normally look like. They're normally well above the starvation line, but uh, in, the, in the blob, or not, yeah, there's blob ears there. Uh, they're more centered on it. So the, the birds were, were really starving. There, there might have been some mitigating factors as well, like uh, there was uh, a big uh, toxic algae bloom uh, not Fukushima, drive that point home. Uh, but it really looks like it was it was starvation. Uh, obviously, there's been some big impacts in fisheries. Um, everyone's probably heard about the big cut in cod quota because cod is really really plummeted. It's maybe on the way down already, but since the blog years, um, really not doing very well. And, and of course, we had a Pretty miserable pink salmon year in 2016. Uh, and we've been seeing it in whales. This is John Moran uh, at Off Bay at Bay Lab. And um, yeah, they're, they're used to seeing dozens to over 100 whales when they go out and do their, their survey. But at the end of last year, they could only find, find 12. So the whales have just kind of, kind of disappeared. <coughs> and they're really not too sure where they're at. So just to finish up, I thought I'd talk a little bit about where we're at and where we might be going. Um, this is a, call it a model plume. Um, there are so many groups out there modeling what's going to happen in the climate, sort of the growth industry. You just compare them all. Um, and this is time along the bottom here. So here is where we're Here's where we're at, uh, December, January, February, January, February, March. So moving towards um, into, into autumn. Um, th this, is, um, this is equatorial Pacific temperatures, which is a little different from here, obviously, but um, it's all connected. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in a, a La Nina, like a fairly weak La Nina right now. But basically, all the model trajectories have us moving back towards uh, ISO neutral within the next year or so. And then in terms of longer term, obviously it's, it's a real challenge to predict what's going to happen in a uh, fantastically complicated system like uh, the climate in the atmosphere and the, the ocean. Uh, th this is some work from uh, it's a couple of years ago now. Um, they, they're using, again, ensembles of models looking at the prevalence of um, blob type conditions. Um, and on the side here, this is, this is just the model versus the observations. So the point is, look, the model is fairly close to what our observations are. Um, but really, the important thing here is, is this figure. And this is um, a time series of just variability in, in temperature. And um, 1950 to 2100. So, so red here is the uh, observed, and, and the black is the anticipated trend. Um, so the, the main point is that we're expecting to see, under our current warming scenarios, uh, an enhancement in this kind of variability. Uh, so we will probably be more likely to see uh, heat waves like these moving into the future. 
that. Do you have any questions? Anybody can answer. Yeah, so, did anybody predict the block? Not that I'm aware of. That would be major bragging rights. So I'm sure if someone had published something, <laughs> we would have heard about it. So you're going for global warming or climate change? <laughs> As a investment strategy or a Hey Rob, in three months you send the equipment out with was that when it was available for those places to fix them or did you choose those three months just because they were most bad? Yeah, the most of the action happens spring to autumn. That's when all the biology is happening. Um, in the winter, there's less biology happening. The equipment is more likely to get damaged. Uh, and I'm often traveling for Christmas, so it's a good time to not have a lot of expensive gear out of the water. <laughs> Where is it, actually? Oh, I yeah, I should have mentioned it's uh, it was on that one graph. It's five miles southeast of Naked Island in What's central the depth? sound. What's the depth? In 200 meters of water. Oh. Is there any measuring? 30 meters? 60. 60. Um, do you measure acidity levels in the uh, salt in the water as well? We don't at present. Um, measuring pH is really, really tricky um, just by itself. And it doesn't tell you everything you need to know uh, ocean acidification wise. You really need um, PCO2, the amount of carbon dioxide that's actually dissolved, but as well as some other things. And the last I talked to the ocean acidification experts, those uh, the instruments that are in development to measure that are really not very good as yet. So they're they're really focused on surface measurements where they can have really elaborate uh, instruments that they have access to and can calibrate. Yeah, it's, it's definitely on our radar. Um, Prince William Sound, or coastal Alaska in general, is really expected to see some big acidification impacts. There's the overall trend. And um, glacier water, melted glacier water, is actually very, very corrosive, uh, much more so than, than regular seawater. So all around the, the glaciers, um, it is a very corrosive what, why? I mean, was it got in it? It's too bad. Uh, it's partly because it has very little CO2 in it, so it can uptake a lot of CO2 and become acidic, and it has very little uh, calcium in it as well, so it's just more corrosive to, to calcium as well. So <laughs> Of water. And what was the distance from Heather Island up to the point that was frozen in sea level? 10 miles? About 10 miles. So it just is 24 miles roughly by now. Well, I think, you know, he's 10 miles from Heather Island to where the base was a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. Dave? Okay. Oh, well, that's about right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dave's got about 300 meters of settlement. <laughs> in there as well to add to that wow. 1,200 and the 400 <laughs> of depth, there's another 300 of sediment that's dumped in a matter of two or three, three or four years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. dynamically. Yeah, yeah, when we were driving around with our sounder going, we recorded it all and the glaciologist had made a bed model trying to basically guess where the bedrock was and sometimes they use radar to measure it, but they're basically kind of guessing by how the ice moved. And they were off by hundreds of meters in some places. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't believe it when I got in there and sent them some data. <laughs> you know, okay, you must be looking at standard and not metric. You got your standards on wrong. <laughs> <long. laughs> yeah, I don't work for NASA. So <laughs> Uh, it needs to be 
Well, it kind of depends on how much the thickness of the ice. Uh, it was basically hard against the moraine in 87, right? Yeah. Um, and so I would think it would be hard to bedrock. Yeah, it would have been hard to bedrock. Yeah. I think Nancy, that it's when it started floating is when they predicted the rapid um, retreat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It retreated off of a shelf and then it got deeper, so it started retreating. Right. We actually found some little springs um, with our CPD uh, right near the bottom, so it might have actually have been being melted from below as well. The uh, one graph you had on the heat flux, mm -hmm. how is that measured? Is it just a it's air temperature to sea temperature comparisons? Or that is a, it's a NOAA data product, so oh. it, it, uh, it comes out of a model, huh. basically. You can, you can estimate it from a weather buoy if you have the water temperature and the air temperature and relative humidity. And I did that with um, the mid sound buoys just to make sure they were uh, kind of the same, but the buoy records only go back to like the 90s. Mm -hmm. But the, the, it's, the, it's the NSEF uh, data part goes back to the 70s, so mm -hmm. it's easy to compare. Yeah, Jeff, you want to talk What is next week? Mm -hmm. I'm blanking. Mm -hmm. Not sure. What? Robert Skoparski? He double booked and he's not going to be able to make it. Oh, okay. So last minute, I'm trying to find someone. If anyone would like to speak next week. <laughs> and if not, there's the concert. If not, there is the um, concert next weekend on Tuesday as well.